If you've been around our church very long, uh, you know the story of Wrong Way Regals. I've told it's one of my favorite stories, sports story, right? So uh, picture a beautiful January 1st, 1929 in Pasadena, California. It's the Rose Bowl National Championship for NCAA football, college football. And uh, Georgia Tech is the, the reigning national champion. They're in the game to repeat, to defend their title. They are playing the University of California Golden Bears. Early on in the game, Roy Regals, who's a defender for California, all-American, tremendous athlete, causes a fumble by Georgia Tech. They're ready to score. He causes a fumble. He picks up the ball, begins to run towards the end zone, runs into his own man, gets spun around, and runs 69 yards the wrong way towards his own end zone. With all of his players following him, yelling at him, Roy, Roy, stop! Finally, one of his own players tackled him on the one-yard line. <laughs> uh, California was so shaken by this mistake, wrong way Regals, that they decided on the very next play, rather than run a play, they punted. And the punt was promptly blocked. <laughs> Giving Georgia Tech two points, they won the game, the national championship, by one point. <laughs> Years afterwards, Wrong Way Roy Regals was presented with a little membership card in the Georgia Tech Athletic Club, <laughs> the wrong team, to which he responded, well, I think I've earned this. Listen, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 27. 1 Samuel chapter 27, we're in, believe it or not, the ninth week of our series on the life of David. Boy, is that gone fast. 1 Samuel 27 a David, still a young man at this point, knows these things. I have been called by God to lead the people of Israel. He will be the next king of Israel. But David also knows that his life has been threatened by the current king of Israel, who's not particularly happy about David going to be the next king. Over, over, a, over a period of months, David has been on the fast track to success. Little known, obscure guy from a small town wins a battle with Goliath and is thrust into the limelight. He has power and fame and access and a great job. In fact, within a couple of years, he marries into the royal family. It's like a rocket ship to success. But with a slow turn of the dial over several months, David's life takes a decidedly negative turn. That king, King Saul, makes David his personal project of misery. <laughs> he pursues him. David loses his job. David loses his marriage to King Saul's daughter. David's life is threatened, and he spends the next several years on the run. By the time we get to 1 Samuel chapter 27, he has faced several threats to the throne. In other words things that would stand in the way of him doing that thing in life God had called him to do. Now, Pastor Austin preached a few weeks ago, and he, he talked about revenge. And one of the threats that David faced was when the pressure was on and he felt like Saul was crushing in on him, he had the opportunity to take revenge on Saul. Here's the very guy who's causing him all this grief, <laughs> and David chooses wisely to turn away from revenge. A few weeks before that, I preached about despair. I mean, do you remember in 1 Samuel 22, David found himself alone, discouraged, and in a cave. It may be the lowest part of David's entire career. And in that case, he fought the battle with despair. And rather than giving in, it was at that low spot in the cave where David's entire trajectory of life began to go on the upswing. Last week, I talked about anger. What a threat anger is to us achieving in life the thing that God's called us to achieve. And David, red with rage, approaching the, uh, the place of slaughtering an innocent man and all of his company employees, is intervened by a wonderful, intelligent, brilliant woman and saves him from all that trouble. David's so impressed by that and marries that woman, and Abigail becomes his wife. Chapter 27 David is likely at the very end of about a five-year period of this turmoil. In fact, it is the last chapter of this season of David's life. And, and that brings David to a place where he begins to discuss with himself. Or see verse 1, he talks about, he says to his own heart, what am I going to do about that? 
fact, look at chapter 1 Samuel 27, look at verse 1. We, we find David frustrated. That thing God has called him to do has at every turn been met with obstacles. And while to this point he's avoided blowing it through a foolish decision, there's no no other word to place on chapter 27 of 1 Samuel but failure. (laughs) And it begins with this conversation. Then David said in his heart, so to whom is David talking? Himself. This is self-talk and it's unhealthy talk. Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. I'm just not... I'm not, going to make, I'm not going to make it. It gives you a little sense of where he's at. There's nothing better for me than I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Really? You've been called by God to be the king of his people Israel. And you think the best plan is to run away from the land of Israel and go to work for the enemy? There is nothing better for me than that I should escape. Driven by a desire for safety, that, by the way, is a legitimate concern, and for comfort, David's ready to go over to the enemy. What David will do is live the next 16 months of his life as a compromised man. Just to give you a feel for what's going on in the the heart of David, I wanted to read to you from Psalm 55. He wrote it from the context of his relationship with the very Saul that he's running away from at this point. Psalm 55, verse 4, My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror overwhelms me. How does that sound to you? Fearful. He's pretty discouraged. Listen, listen to verse 6. Listen, because we've been there. What David is about to write as a song to express his deep frustration and fear about what Saul is doing to him is exactly where you and I have been at times in our life. Oh, that I had the wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest, right? Don't say it out loud, but you've been there, haven't you? If I could just get away from all that's troubling me. I just, I want to go away. I want to run away from it all. And I would fly away and be at rest. I would wander far away. I would lodge in the wilderness. I would hurry to find a shelter from the raging wind and the tempest. What raging wind, David? What tempest? What's what's so hard for you? And verse 12, it's not an enemy who taunts me. Then I could bear it. It's not an adversary who deals insolently with me. Then I could hide from him. But it is you. A man who is my equal, my familiar friend, my companion. We used to take sweet counsel together within God's house. We walked in the throng. Hey, we used to be friends, and you've turned, and now I can't trust you, and that breaks my heart. And uh, David in discouragement. My companion stretched out his hands against his friends. He violated his covenant. His speech was smooth as butter. Oh, he said wonderful things to me, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet his words were drawn swords. David finds himself in 1 Samuel chapter 27, frustrated and fearful and, and, and frankly, tired of it. We've learned some lessons about David from these first weeks of his study. Can I, let me summarize them before we get into chapter 27. The three lessons from the life of David thus far, God's calling almost always leads to a cave before it leads to the throne. Right? God's calling almost always lead to a cave before they lead to the throne. If you're going to be serious about pursuing what God has called you to do and to be, almost inevitably you're going to find yourself like David was in a place of discouragement, hurt, maybe despair, (laughs) frustration. Alan Redpath writes this of this chapter in David's life. At a moment we find, at, at any moment we find David facing circumstances calculated to tempt him to blazing anger. An immediate retaliation. 
At another moment, we find him surrounded by such constant and overwhelming attacks from his lifelong enemy that he is discouraged, almost ready to give up. Listen to Redpath's conclusion of what God is doing in David's life during this season of uncertainty and fear. Here is the anvil upon which the character of a man of God is hammered out. The fiery furnace through which he is melted and poured out as steel for the glory of God. Thus, the iron gets into a man's soul. Or I might add, to a woman's soul as well. There's something, if there's nothing else, rather, we learned about the life of David thus far, it's simply this you're going to go through the cave before you get to the throne. If you're like me and you hadn't read David's life for a while, you begin to read it and you think, okay, now David, I think there's something about like a sheep and a giant and then he's king and they're like, it's over, right? Here we are nine weeks into it. He still hasn't sniffed the throne, but he's been at the cave and today we find him discouraged and ready to run away. And so uh, three lessons from David's life. God's calling almost always leads to the cave before it leads to the throne. Second, success is not permanent. We've been there too, right? Killed a giant, I'm on to the road to success. Just got a great job, now I got a promotion, now I married the owner's daughter. That could be a real trouble. But anyway, now I married the owner's daughter. and (laughs) All that success stacked up one after the other, after the other, after the other, and guess what? That was followed by five years of wilderness wandering in David's life, which was exactly, by the way, where God had him to teach him how he was going to be king. Third lesson, failure is not final. I love that. Yeah, yeah, David's threatened by anger, and he's threatened by revenge, and he's threatened by despair, and today we'll see, actually, he lives a compromised life. That's a fail, David, and that is not final. 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse 1, the end, uh, there's nothing better for me that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and it works. Look at the end of verse 1. Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of his. I shall escape out of his hand. So David arose and went over, he and his 600 men. Remember, he's got a little band of brothers following him. He has responsibility for them. This is why he's so discouraged that living out in the wilderness as a renegade, he can't support them. And Um, verse 2, they went to Achish, son of Maok, king of Gath. Remember Gath? He's been there once before. That time he escaped by himself, and then he recognized that he was going to be put in prison, and so he ran and he got out of there. This time he comes back as the head of a band of 600 in an army, and uh, Achish is like, oh, i got to respect you now. And Look at verse 3. David lived with Achish at Gath, he and his man, and every man in his household. There must have been a 1,000, maybe 2,000 people in this group of people now. Uh, the, the soldiers, their family, their, uh, their uh, ch- uh, wives and children. And Look at verse 4. And when it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer sought him. You know what you call this? Temporary relief. And the threat's really not off of David. David has just turned away from his responsibility and his calling. Uh, Verses 5, 6, 7, then David said to Achish, if I found favor in your eyes, let a place be given to me in one of the country towns. All right, look, I don't want to live in the capital here. There's kind of like not room enough for the both of us. And and so uh, Achish gives him a town called Ziklag. You know, I'm sorry about that, but (laughs) that's the best town David could get, right? Ziklag, and it was down south of of Gath. It was out in the wilderness area, and and David's like, okay, I'll take it. And so look at... um, Verse 6, that day Achish gave him Ziklag. Ziklag is belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Verse 7, and the number of the days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. See if I understand, David, what you're saying to me. Although you know God has called you to serve him, Although you understand that that calling on your life means you're going to have to do these things in life, right? Responsibility for the people of God, leadership, fighting the battles. You are choosing because you are discouraged, you are frustrated, you are choosing to turn around and walk away from your responsibilities. Not only that, you're choosing to live among the enemy. Here's the problem, right? Here's the problem with David. It's not about his location. It's about his loyalty. 
I get that you want to be safe. In fact, that is a very legitimate concern. A little space between him and Saul probably was good. But David, Israel's a big country. Do you have to go to the enemy? Do you have to sit down with a king and say, hey, I want to play for your side now? David, you're going the wrong way. This opens up this season of 16 months of compromise and sin in David's life. Look at verse 8. Verses 1 through 7, the first decision David made that was wrong was to run from his responsibility, run away from his calling. It's not about location, it's about loyalty. The second decision David made was to live a lie for more than a year. David and his men went up and made raids against the Geshurites, the Gerzites, the Amalekites, for these were the inhabitants of the land from of old, as far as sure from the land of Egypt. What all that means is that David made his money as sort of a mercenary band, and different kings would pay him, go to war for me, okay, and, and he was mostly going south. And he lists these three names of these cities that I really can't pronounce, and you can't pronounce either, but trust me, there are three cities in the south, and and so look at um, verse 10. David would strike the land, all right? He would just go, he'd take it. And he would go back to King Achish and he'd give him sort of a, you know, a portion. Like, okay, Achish, thanks for letting me have the town of Ziklag. Here's, you know, some sheep and some goats and some pelts and whatever. It's kind of a tax on David living there. And so when Achish asked David, where have you made a raid today? David would say, against the Negeb. Negeb means south. So in the south land, against the Negeb of Judah. Or against the Negeb of the, those people. Or against the Negeb of the Kenites, right? The Jer- uh, uh, Jera, against that, that group, right? And so uh, I tried it during the week, but I'm not up here, you know, without a net, I'm not going to try it. Uh, question, question, if you're an astute reader of this text, do those three lists line up? No. I thought you were going to Gesher, David. I thought you were going to Gerza, David. I thought you were going to the Amalekites, David. But you told him you were at the Jeremelites in Judah. Uh, you know what you call that? The technical term for that? The Bible term for that? That's a lie. Verse um, 11. It's brutal. You begin living a life of compromise. You begin live, uh, lying about that. and You're going to have to make further compromises. You may find yourself very far from God's calling. You may find yourself doing things you would have never conceived doing, but, well, you got to keep the lie alive. David would leave neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, thinking lest they should tell about us and say, so David has done. Okay, so you're going to cover up your lies by murder? We choose to live a compromised life. We choose to turn our back on what God's calling us to be and do. We choose to live and work for the enemy. That's a very dangerous choice. And that could take us to places we would have never conceived we would find ourselves. Look at the end of verse 11. Such was David's custom all the while he lived in the country of the Philistines. You know what that means? David lived in compromise for a long season of life. Verse 12, Achish trusted David, thinking he has made himself an utter stench to his people Israel. Therefore, he shall always be my servant. This is the second time where in the short term, David's achieving his goals by lying. Saul leaves him alone. David says, I'm going to get out of Dodge. Well, David, you can do that. Why are you fighting for the enemy, though? Now are you fighting for the enemy, you're lying to the guy who's learning to trust you, this new king Achish. <laughs> What's so amazing about this is David didn't need to lie. The three towns he mentioned where he actually did the raiding, so this is where he really went, were both enemies of Israel and enemies of the Philistines. David could have marched right into Achish's palace and throne room and said, hey, I went ABC today, and Achish would have been great. Love it. What he did instead was march in there and name three cities in Judah. His own homeland... (laughs) Judah's part of Israel, his own homeland, and how about this, Achish, closest enemy. David's lying to try and ingratiate himself with the king. 
David's trying to create an image of her for himself that's not at all true with reality. He chooses not only to flee from his calling, he chooses to lie about what that lifestyle is like. He's going to live a compromised life. He's going to lie about it. He's going to do things he would have never thought to do because of that. And the third decision he makes is in chapter 28, verses 1 and 2. This compromised life came to a head when one day the king Achish said, Listen, David, we're going to go fight your homeland, Israel. And you're going to play for my team now. You recognize why I told the story of wrong way regals? David is running as fast as he can towards the wrong goal line. In those days, the Philistines gathered their forces for war against Israel. Israel, David, where's your home? Israel, who are you ready to fight against? Israel, you can't do that. Achish said to David, understand that you and your men are to go out with me to the army. Now, if you're David, don't you say, listen, man, I got a migraine. I can't do that. (laughs) Or no, 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 I've already booked a war for next week. I'm sorry, I'm just not available. I mean, any excuse to David, it's not a problem for you to lie, right? You've demonstrated that. And, And I don't know, I don't know if David is so compromised by this point he doesn't know what he's saying or if he's just so conniving and lying at this point he'll say whatever I've read commentators and scholars during this last week they don't know either (laughs) but look at his response in verse 2 David said Achish very well listen 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 you shall know what your servant can do you want to see me fight put me on against my own people. Now, it's a pretty subtle way he answered that because he didn't say, I'll fight against Israel. He said, you'll see what I can do. Some scholar thinks what he actually intended to do was to be able to go with Achish and then when the battle got on, he would turn and he would fight for Israel and get himself back in the good graces of Israel. The point is, we're so confused by David's lie and compromise, we have no idea what he really intends to do. Look at chapter 29. David chose to run from God's calling on his life. He chose to live a lie, a compromised life. And David chose to fight for the enemy. Chapter 29, what's planned in chapter 27 comes to pass. They're they're gathering, man. The the Philistines have gathered by the hundreds and by thousands, and, and they're beginning to march north towards Israel. And David and his men, shockingly, are in that group of armies. They're in the rear guard, but they're there. And as they're marching along, the the, the Philistine generals, the general command of the army is looking and they're saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. uh, They got the wrong uniform on here. And they call Achish, say, Achish, no, 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 no. David, remember, he's the guy that killed Goliath. They even quote the song. Remember, Saul has slain his thousands, David his tenth. What are you thinking about? Get rid of him. And, and Achish is like, no, really, you understand. He said, like, get rid of him. And so uh, is it verse 6? Is it verse 6? Look at uh, chapter 29. Sure, yeah, verse 6. Uh, Achish called David and said to him, as the Lord lives. No, wait, you have been honest. Now stop for a minute. As the Lord lives, you have been honest. Interesting note, in chapter 27, in chapter 29, covering 16 months of David's life, no one mentions the Lord's name except a foreign king who's been deceived by David. For 16 months, there's not a hint that David even thought about, cared about, or mentioned the name of the very God who called him to be the next king. The only time God's name is mentioned is by this king who David has lied to for a year, a year and a half. And as the Lord lives, you have been honest. To me, it seems right. By the way, uh, question, has David been honest? What's the answer? It seems right that you should march out with me in the campaign. I have found nothing wrong in you from the day of your coming to me till this day. Is that right or wrong? It's wrong. David's lying, compromising, sneaking. Nevertheless, the Lord's, it's almost as though this King Achish is apologetic. Nevertheless, the Lord's do not approve of you. Go back now and go peaceably that you may not displease the Lord's of the Philistines. Now look at verse 8. 
David's just going to play this lie out to the very end. David said to Achish, what have I done? What have you found in your servant from the day and at your service until now? He's quoting Achish's words back to him. That I may not go and fight against, wait a minute, wait a minute, fight against whom? Who does he say? The enemies? Now your own people are the enemy? The baby's just agreeing with that point. Thank you. Uh, now your own people are your enemies? David, David, do you know what's happening in your heart? Well, he, he doesn't buy that. Verse 9, uh, Achish answered David and said, I know that you are blameless. Third time. I know you are blameless. True or false? It's False. David, you're a liar. You're living a compromised life. You're fighting for the enemies of God, not for your own people. And I know you're blameless in my sight. How about this? As blameless as an angel of God. Well, I got news for you, folks. David's an angel, but it's not a good angel, right? <laughs> but nevertheless, you got to go back. And so go, go back at first light. And uh, David went back at first light. This was really one of God's gracious ways to save him from fighting against his own people. But let's just be honest about what's going on in David's life. When we give in to sin and lies and deceit, we can find ourselves fighting against the very God who called us to serve him. Alan Redpath is pretty direct. He is a pastor from about two generations ago who writes on the life of David, it is a tragedy in the life of a child of God when he yields to the pressure of Satan. He is reduced to scheming and planning. And when he is driven into a tight corner, he can only escape by deceit. Suddenly the man who is given in realizes he has purchased his deliverance from the pressure of the devil at too great of a price. He has obtained release from the tension for a moment, but he's exchanged the smile of God for the grin of the devil. He's exchanged the protection of Jesus Christ for the flimsy walls of deceit, just like David exchanged the call of God, the trust in the promise of God, for the walls of Ziklag, the city that Achish had given to him. Soon those walls were going to be burned by fire and David would weep scalding, bitter tears of repentance over that decision. Oh, the harm that is done by a man who gives in to the enemy. It's sad to read a great hero of the faith who's degenerated to the point of fighting for the enemy who's so compromised in the way he lives his life that he's walking in deceit, he's walking in sin, he's walking in compromise, he's finding himself doing things he would have never conceived of himself doing. And let's be really perfectly honest with ourselves. We have been there at times in our lives as well. Maybe some are there right now. David's three choices led him very far from God. They led him to a place of hurting the people closest to him and actually being willing to fight against the God who called him to be king. There are some choices you and I have to make when we find ourselves living a kind of compromised life that David lived. By the way, did we mention this was a long season? 16 months at the minimum. So, so let's, let's turn the corner, let's pivot, let's talk about choices you and I need to make if we're going to get back to living the right kind of life, to pursuing the calling that God has called us to in life. Three choices that lead us toward the throne. Okay, not away from it. Every choice that David made in this season of life, every choice took him further from the throne that God had promised that he would have. Three choices three steps further away from that throne. Here are some choices that you and I can make when we find ourselves in the land of the Philistines, when we find, uh, find ourselves willing to make choices or compromises that are hurtful to our walk with God or those around us and people are scratching their head like, what are you doing? Here are some choices we need to make. One, choose integrity over dishonesty. 
choose integrity over dishonesty. David, I get you want to be safe. Of course, we need to be safe. And I get you want to put some space between yourself and Saul. I get it. Saul has an entire army at his disposal. If he finds you, he'll kill you. But why would you go fight for the enemy? Big desert out there. You can live in the wilderness in a lot of spaces without having to take up arms against your own people. And why would you lie to this enemy? What is it you're trying to accomplish through lying? You and I, to get back on the path of walking with God, you and I, to get out of a compromised life, we're going to have to choose integrity over dishonesty. We're going to have to be honest about that. Now, I'm not talking about going on some television show and talking about the secret life you've lived. (laughs) I'm talking about finding that one man or that one woman to whom you can be very honest, with whom you can, uh, to, uh, who you can trust, and telling them the truth. Because the longer we live a compromised life, the harder that fall is when that becomes uncovered, and it will become uncovered. Integrity means going to God and being honest about that. And then I've got to find a human being, flesh and blood, that I can trust who can tell me the truth and love me but also help hold me accountable as I make the steps back toward the kind of life that honors God. In fact, the kind of life that God has called me to enjoy. I choose integrity over dishonesty. Make it right. Get some help. Second choice. Choose calling over comfort. This whole episode begins in chapter 27 when David says in his heart. So he's not, he's not thinking straight, and so he's not talking to himself straight. And his self-talk leads him to a very bad choice. There is nothing better for me than I should escape to the land of the Philistines. That's just a lie, David. So the, the first lie he told was to himself. David chose comfort over calling. God had said, David, you will be the next king of Israel. You'll be the one who will fight my battles. You will be the one who will care for my people. You will be the one through whom I will accomplish great things in life. And under the press of constant pressure and the tension building up over the months and years, David lost sight of the calling, and all he could think of was, how do I get out from under this pressure? Any mother of a preschooler understands that. <laughs> Single person, man, we, we, we live in a day where the calling is simply fulfill yourself, all you desire, you deserve. Do you remember that God has called you to put on display the glorious goodness of Jesus Christ in your life as a single man or woman? Can you leverage the freedom you have, maybe the financial security you find, can you leverage that for kingdom use and not consume it upon your own comfort? Husbands and wives, marriage ain't easy, but it's our calling. So many people, you get focused on, yeah, well, you know what, this is what I want out of this marriage. And I get it. That's a legitimate concern, right? But the focus has to be on those things I do control, which is how I can fulfill my part of the commitment, my calling as a husband to love my wife patiently, strongly, firmly, protectively as Christ loves the church, sacrificially. Or wife, you can do what God has called you to do, to love and and respect and be a part of this family of faith to do that for your husband to be patient as God continues his perfecting work in his life. Parents, whether they're newborns, whether they're preschoolers, whether they're those middle schoolers or high schoolers or college, you know, God's called you to be active involved in the life of your sons and your daughters. I know they can drive you crazy. I know you'd never never consider sending them out, but you might consider murder. I get that, right? Man, this is the calling. Dial down the frustration level by uh, by dialing up the clarity on what God has called you to do in the life of these young boys and girls. Just just don't tell lies to yourself. 
on your job, shocking as it may sound, on your job, your boss's job is not to make you happy. I know that comes as a surprise to some. Your boss's job is to get the most out of you <laughs> and give you the least. Help him succeed. Help her have a good quarter. And see what happens if God doesn't begin to open doors of opportunity for you. Don't lose sight of your calling. Don't sacrifice that on the altar of comfort. Three, choose trust over fear. Maybe if you dig down just a little bit, the very heart of David's compromised life was fear. Fear for his life, fear of what he was missing out on, fear of what he lost, a fear of what he would lose. And his focus became, he said in his heart, I, I, I. And he totally lost sight of the promises of God. In fact, I just love Proverbs 10, 9. I'm going to ask the projectionist to show that. Because God makes some promises. Proverbs 10, 9 says this, The man of integrity walks securely, but he who takes crooked paths will be found out. If the path out of the compromised life into a place of God's blessing is truth, are we willing to trust the promise? The three promises God gives us that provide strength for today. Let's, let's finish the message not on that, that hard word of a prophetic voice, conviction, as important as that is. Let's, let's finish this message on the word of promise. Three promises that give us strength for today. Number one, God has a purpose for your life. Deeper than anything else that drives your behavior, you've got to know that. God created you for His glory and for your good and to make an impact and leave a legacy in this world. Do you know that? It's true in the cave. It's true when we are discouraged. It's true in the wilderness. It's true at our greatest success. It's true at our lowest failures. It's true when we're living a compromised life for the enemy. That's what makes living a compromised life so devastatingly bad for the believer. That's not what God has created us or called us to do. Greatest success, deepest failures... Married, single, parent, or lost a child, widowed, or living a long life, health or sickness, wealth or poverty, God has a purpose for you. And God is living out that purpose in your life, even in this season now. And as a loving father, he will do what it takes to get us on the road towards that purpose. I mean, lock it down, make this an anchor for your soul. You are created for a purpose. Let me give you the most basic, the simplest purpose God created you for, relationship. And yet, given the human condition, we often feel far from God or unworthy of a God. That's what drives us to work so hard to earn his favor. Listen, that's not the way God works. He created us, and as a father has a son or a daughter, he loves us. And he invites us to be in a restored relationship. That never comes by me working harder. That comes by me trusting Jesus Christ as Savior because God in the person of Jesus Christ provided for my reconciliation. All the wrong, all the sin, all the compromised living was placed on Jesus Christ and he died on the cross. Don't you remember his cry from the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because that's how God treats sin. He judges it. And Jesus Christ, innocent though he was, was bearing the sins of the world, including this guy's and yours. And he rose again. Jesus Christ rose again from the day of dead, triumphant over sin and hell and death. And when I believe that, I am given eternal life. I'm made a part of the family of God. And that first greatest purpose in my life, being a relationship with the God creator of the world, is fulfilled. By the way, after that, a lot of other things begin to make sense and fall into place. If you're not sure where you stand, make that right. You trust Jesus Christ. You do that today. You get out of enemy territory, begin fighting for the right side. And three promises to give us strength for today. God is a purpose for my life. Secondly, God sanctifies your hurt. God sanctifies your hurt. Sanctify is a Bible word that means he sets it apart for a good purpose. He makes it holy. 
meaning the thing that you fear or the thing that may have driven you to a place of compromise or makes you think about compromising, God will use that to prepare you for the throne. David simply wasn't ready as a young man with a series of successes under his belt. He wasn't ready to do the thing God had called him to do. Now you take that man, you crush him, you grind him, you work hard with him for the next four, five, six, ten years. Now you got a king in the making. God sanctifies your hurt. He doesn't waste it. He never wastes those kinds of things. You talk about the purpose you have in life, don't you ever forget that God is going to take that hurt, that disappointment, even the season you live with the Philistines in compromise, and he will use that for his glory, for our good, to benefit someone else. Don't don't have the kind of self-deception David had. Well, the best thing for me is to go live with the enemy. No, it's not. (laughs) The best thing for you is to realize God has a purpose for your life, and he will sanctify even the things that hurt you. Third, God never leaves us alone. David had the promise from Deuteronomy. He just forgot it. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. That is a promise that God has given to his people from the very first day. Even when Adam and Eve, with all of their foolishness, fell into sin, God went after them when they hid. (laughs) And he does that for us too. You may think you're in the cave, you're in the wilderness, or you're living a compromised life, and I'm just out here by myself. You are not. I talked about wrong Roy uh, Roy Regals, right? And uh, California and Georgia Tech. And halftime, Regals went into the locker room, sat in the corner, as you can imagine, right? He sat in the corner, head down, and he refused to come out for the second half. His coach, Nibs Price, called him and said, you got to go back out for the second half. Here is what Regal said. Coach, I can't do it. I've ruined you. I've ruined myself. I've ruined the University of California. I couldn't face that crowd to save my life. I love what Roy uh, what." Uh, um, Nibs Price said next, Coach Price said this, Roy, get up and go back out there. The game is only half over. (laughs) That's true in our lives as well. Success, failure, sin, compromise, life, that game's half over. Here's what God is calling us to do, knowing that he will never leave us, never will he forsake us. He's saying, will you get up, shake off that sorrow, and you get back out in the game, because I have called you to fulfill a calling in life. Let me pray with you. Let's pray. And let me give you a moment, perhaps. Maybe I'm talking today, and you're saying, man, it feels like you're reading my mail, Scott. (laughs) Well, you know, I got mail too, right? And so... Why don't, we, why don't we take a moment? Ethan gave us 30 seconds earlier in the service to think about what God has done in our life to this point. Let me give you 30 more seconds to think about what you ought to do to get back in the game for God now. Father, thank you for the power of your word that so often comforts and as needed convicts, but Lord always leaves us with a sense of hope. Father, I pray that those of us who have found ourselves at times discouraged or overwhelmed would not lose sight of the fact you have called us and you will enable us to do the thing you've called us to do. Father, I pray for those who may be here feeling a little heavy-hearted because they have, in fact, been living a compromised life. They totally identify with David in the land of the Philistines. God, I pray that we would be honest, we would call it what it is, sin, and we would forsake it and turn around. It's time to go home. Father, I pray for any that do not or have not till this point trusted Jesus Christ as Lord. They would know that that is the pathway home, that your greatest love for us is demonstrated in the person of Jesus Christ. We would trust him. 
Father, forgive us our sins, but give us great hope and strength and confidence in your presence for the future, I pray. Give us strength as we go through the cave, the wilderness, or the valley. God, help us to never, never lose sight of your purpose for our life. Thank you for David's story, Lord. Really, it's our story. God, give us grace for this week, I pray. In Jesus' name, and all God's people agreed by saying.